Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. For those who have gathered, I'm, I'm seeing some, some newer faces because some people are coming back for the first time. If that's the case, welcome. Um, for those of you who are watching on Facebook Live, I know that there's been challenges of late and we're praying to the lesser gods of technology that we would find freedom. But so far we have not. We are keep trying this next week. There's some paths that we're pursuing, but hopefully that little circle that spins around and around will go away. Is that, did I say that right? Is that close? Yes. So again, uh, please persist. We are trying. We have created a safe, socially distant space for worship. Service is now open to all with no reservations required. We will, be taking, we will not be taking your temperature, and we do ask folks to sign in in the back before uh, leaving the sanctuary today so we can have a record of attendance just in case. Uh, we are, though, going to try something today with technology. Um, if you have a cell phone, which means if you are breathing, could you put it on airplane mode for the service? I'm not going to go through the aisle and check, like on a flight, but if you can do that, we're going to see if that might have even the slightest bit of help to us. So I'm going to keep talking, um, but I would encourage you at some point to, to turn your phone to airplane mode, and we'll see. I was told it couldn't hurt. Uh, after worship, please join us for some light refreshments out in front of the sanctuary, but this is in bold letters. There will be no coffee. Uh, on exciting word, we have a very successful rummage sale yesterday. The Presbyterian women received more than $4,100. Uh, we also welcome back all those who participated in the adult habitat trip to Roanoke. Uh, I've heard from Reverend Carmen, a lot of work got done, which I'm going to take as a positive report. I'm sure there'll be more to follow. This Wednesday will be the last youth group gathering until the fall. The junior and senior highs will meet together from 6 to 8 p.m. this Wednesday. Those are the announcements that I'm supposed to read according to Mary Matlock. I would like to invite Janet to come forward to give the call to worship. Please rise if you're able. I give thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his promise for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, and yours forever. Thank you. 
sometimes the truth is easy to speak and other times it's a challenge. It's difficult often to confess. Hence, when we gather together, we practice. We try to find common words to confess so that the uncommon ones will come easily to us in our lives. Let us join our hearts in common prayer of adoration and confession. God of mercy, your steadfast love leads us and guides us. You are a light unto our feet. Forgive us when we exchange love for hate. Forgive when we refuse to follow. Forgive us darkness we covet. We seek to cover what has been revealed. Give us the strength of faith so we may trust truth above all else. Amen. To trust the truth we must love, for only love casts out fear. Know that we have confessed and been forgiven, and be at peace. In Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Amen. I'd like to invite people who are small to come closer to their television or computer screen, or, or if you have a tablet, don't come closer, just look. Because I think that would be too close if you came closer. So I wanted to tell you a story today about something that happened to me when I was a little boy. I was playing with my friend Bert. Well, Bert threw a rock and he broke a window, a big window. This was a big window. When my father came around to say, who broke the window? Guess what Bert said? He said he did it, and he pointed at me. Well, I didn't break the window, so I looked at Bert. And you know what I saw in his face? I saw a lot of fear. He was really afraid. See, sometimes when people make mistakes, they're afraid to tell the truth. Maybe you felt that. Maybe you've experienced it. Something bad has happened and it was your fault, but you don't know if you should tell the truth. It's happened to me, too. Mistakes I've made. And I wonder, ooh, will someone still like me if I tell the truth? But you know what I do? I always remember Bert, that look on his face. I was so sad for him that he was so afraid. Sometimes it takes courage to tell the truth. So if you're afraid to tell the truth, well, remember Bert. Remember that you don't have to be afraid to tell the truth. It's always bad. So will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, help us to always tell the truth, even when it's scary. Be with us so the words that we say are true. Amen. The first scripture reading this morning is from Jeremiah, chapter 6, verses 13 through 17. <clears throat> for from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have treated the wound of my people carelessly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. They acted shamefully. They committed abomination. Yet they were not ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroad and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way lies and walk in and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in. Also, I raised up my sentinels for you. Give heed to the sound of the trumpet. 
but they said, we will not give heed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be. Swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let it sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take thy love, my Lord, I pour, at thy feet is treasure store. warming up act is better than the, than the, the build act. It's a tough day, so it's a tough day here. Matt, thanks for that. The scripture lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 34 through 39. Don't think that I've come to bring peace to the earth, Jesus said. I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, and a daughter in law, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter in law against her mother in law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake, well, they'll find it. The gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, sometimes we don't know how... To to begin with your word, it's tough. So give us strength, give us clarity of mind, but mostly open our hearts so that you can write these words upon us. Amen. 
few months after my father died, we started to go through the photo albums. They were filled with the images of him being a grandfather. He loved to be there for the kid moments, especially the fun ones. I remembered a, a cluster of these photos this week and smiled each time I thought of them. It was a trip we shared to Disneyland. The memory that came to me, it was of the sword and the stone. Remember that movie, Sword and the Stone? One photo was of my eldest son atop the stone. You could see his face and his taunt, 10-year-old muscles, sincere belief that just maybe this sword is going to come out. He, he strained and he, and he pulled with all his might. The next photo was of our daughter, Laura. She, too, was perched atop the stone, grasping the sword. But the look on her face was, <laughs> come on, take the photo already, would you? The difference of those pictures is what I keep coming back to. The one was a real effort, a belief in possibility. The other was a recognition of how responsible my daughter Laura is. I'm sure in her eight-year-old brain, she'd already done the math and deduced the liability for Disney was too great for that sword to go anywhere. They would make sure that sword stayed in the, so in the stone, king or no king. Audacious hope and grounded responsibility it was as if you could see their lives lived forward. The sword and the stone is a fun legend. Only the true king can draw the sword Excalibur from the stone. It's a much less creepy version than the Lady of the Lake version where the, the spirit woman who lives in a deep lock is summoned to rise and hand the true king his sword. Pretty sure Disney didn't debate very long over which version of the story they'd put in the theme park. Although they're obvious and, and terrible instruments of death, we love swords, and for some reason, we love to give children swords. Give a child a death-dealing blade for fun? Well, of course. Kids love swords. And if we balk at such instruments of, of war to be given to children. We don't like that. Kids don't mind. Empty holders of wrapping paper, a sword. Thin branch on the ground, a sword. Just about anything that you can swing about, sword. Kids may prefer and cry out for the lightsaber that is illumined red, blue, or green, and makes swishing sounds when swung. But they can make the sounds on their own with just about any rod or stick. And they do. Kids love swords. And admit it. No matter how old you are, there is still an impulse to swing a stick and thrust and parry. How many of us have had an awkward moment where we were caught being a musketeer or a pirate when such activity was not really age appropriate any longer. I guess I'm only speaking to myself here. The Bible speaks of swords. The word sword appears 364 times. That's a lot for the Bible. Yet the use of the word is a bit lopsided in terms of testaments. The New Testament speaks of swords 27 times. If you're trying to do the math, compare it to the Old Testament, it's 337 to 27. The New Testament is, shall we say, light in terms of sword references. The New Testament has two types of sword references. The, the literal reference to swords, like Peter cut off the high priest's slave's ear with a sword. There's the warning of dying by the edge of the sword. But then, 
for the most part, there's a lot of metaphorical or symbolic references. Our reading today falls into the second category. Jesus says, I've come bringing a sword, not peace, to the earth. But this sword is not Excalibur or a magic sword or even a Jedi lightsaber, although that would be cool. No, it's a, it's a sword of truth, a sword of the Spirit, a sword of the Word of God, which is how Paul and Hebrews and the writer of Revelation interpret it. The sword Jesus brings is truth. Before we get to this, though, I, I want to spend just a bit of time on the rest of the passage. It's a tough one. In fact, all the passages in the 10th and 11th chapters of Matthew are tough. Tough and important. In fact, we may be so mesmerized by the sword reference Again, it may just be me who's mesmerized, but we might miss that Jesus has introduced three of his greatest teachings in a row. You must love me more than all else. You must pick up your cross. You must lose your life in order to gain it. You might be like me and get get lost in the sword reference or the idea that Jesus is bringing discord, division, and family. And this is tough. But this challenge, though, really hinges, all of these passages, all of them hinge on this image of the sword. The sword of truth that Jesus brings. If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, as John proclaimed, then Jesus is telling us, you must love truth more than all else. You must love truth more than anyone or anything or any moment. And then the next teaching, the cross, you must sacrifice yourself for the truth. You give your life to what you love. You risk everything for true desire. And the kicker, unless you love truth more than all else and sacrifice your life for it, you lose life. This is the hardest of the truth of the gospel that Jesus offers again Again, it's the hardest part because it demands we let go of control. To give your life away for truth means you cannot control the truth. And we love control almost as much as children love swords. Sometimes this series of teachings is confused with being serious about truth, serious in the sense of defending doctrine or tradition or orthodoxy. We've all seen the images of martyrs for the faith, people who are willing to die for their faith, the heroic are slain, so to proclaim the sword is an image of dying for your faith in battle. I was standing in a cemetery in, in Malawi, Africa, many years ago. And the pastor who was giving the tour of the grounds, an early missionary site, called our attention to the graves of the young men and women who traveled from Scotland in the late 1800s and died on the shore of Lake Nyasa from malaria. So many young men and women came to Malawi after David Livingston to fulfill his mission, to risk, to pick up a cross, as he did. They answered the call to spread the gospel to, to the people of Africa, and so many of them met an early demise to the fevers and palsy malaria brings before death. The pastor pointed to the graves 
and said, we need more people like these, people who will come to Malawi and die. Eyes widened and mouths gave open and there was a few mumbled <laughs> gasps. And I cleared my throat and I said, <clears throat> uh, perhaps, yes, it would be good if more people came here and lived a long life, enjoyed the beauty and the people of Malawi and stayed to the end of their life and then died at a ripe old age after offering their gifts of skills to our brothers and sisters in mission. Pastor paused and thought about it. Yes, that's exactly the point. Live long life and then die. <laughs> that's the best joke I had the whole sermon. I got nothing, nothing. Man, tough crowd today. I told you. So the missionary graves in Malawi on the lake shore, they're heartbreaking. So many of the markers have years not reaching 30. There's one gravestone that haunts me. It, it just says, baby. They came to preach the truth of Jesus, they, to offer love and hope. They gave up their lives. Malawi was their cross, and upon this cross they gave their life. They left family and friends. They, they most likely sowed discord. Most likely, some of them heard a mother or father or, sim, or a sibling say, why? would you do this? The truth is a two-edged sword. The first edge is the need to be responsible, to keep your word, to speak the truth plainly and simply without fanfare or unnecessary embellishment. This is the truth of every day. <clears throat> Here the temptations are subtle, and the devotion demands great art and skill, for how do you navigate the slight omission that tempts the lie? How do you speak to both sides if you only believe one? Is the truth a measure of compassion or a measure of judge judgment? Well, it's both. Here is my daughter, Laura, trying not to pull the sword from the stone. Her honesty is the admission that this is not supposed to work. Here is the truth of the everyday, the slow play, the need for risk assessment. Truth is a two-edged sword. The second edge is the need to risk, to sacrifice, to be willing to lose your life in order to gain it. There are moments where this edge of truth is all that there is. Moments of make or break, go big or go home. This is often misconstrued as bravado or bluster or some sort of belligerence. But the truth sometimes is very, very demanding. There's no art here, no subtlety. This is where you dare to speak, dare to be counted with those deemed unworthy. This is what I could see in that picture of our eldest, believing, hoping against hope, this sword would rise from the stone. He really tried. 